our next speaker has already some experience with reverse engineering. For his master thesis, he took a look, closer look at Skype and got into a bit of trouble with the company and got sued by them and got followed in two different countries by them. Now he turned his attention to another device and he's looking at these micro tick root routers. And um, hopefully he hasn't gotten any bad experience so far and he's quite hopeful that it will stay that way. Let's see and enjoy the talk while it lasts, while he hasn't, got any, hasn't gotten sued yet. <laughs> so please welcome to the stage Kirill Solovyuk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I haven't been sued by these guys yet because this is the first conference I'm presenting this at, I guess. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so I do have a lot of things to talk about to you today on this topic. I actually had to cut my slide deck down a bit. So the missing slides are going to be presented at Balkan in Serbia. 15th of September, if you want to see them. Uh, but because there are so much stuff to talk about, I will skip this part about who I am and what do I do. If you guys are interested about who am I, you can follow my Twitter. You can see what I do on my research page. So go there. I'm hacking always, even when companies wouldn't want me to be reversing or looking at their stuff. I always do that. But still, for this presentation, here's a nice slide of a legal disclaimer. The goal of this research that I'm doing here with Microtik is to achieve the interoperability of computer programs, in this case, software running on Microtik routers with other computer programs. And one example, of course, would be we have an Apple on one side, we have a printer on the other side, and there's this neat protocol that Apple devices talk to the printers called AirPrint. Well, if there's a micro router in between these two devices and they're on, on different subnets, then it doesn't really work. But luckily, there are services that allow you to fix that. The problem is you cannot really integrate this service into micro router because not unlike these devices here, micro devices are also closed, and you cannot get full access to your hardware. So one application of my research is that. I also would, of course, like to acknowledge prior research done by other people. Some time ago, nine years ago, if I'm not mistaken, Anthony from forum awmn.net did initial analysis of NPK format and we can talk about what that format is. Drubica later on implemented NPK file and packaging. OpenVRT team, we're grateful to them for the kernel config files, which allows us to achieve what we have achieved a bit easier. Also the team. Um, only I could come here today, but we also have Jans Janssons, who was doing static binary analysis and was creating the boot-up sequence. Uh, for our tool. And we have Emil Romanis who did the music part. So can we have a round of applause for these guys that are not here? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about four things. I want, you to give, uh, I want to give you a little bit of overview into Router OS, which is the operating system on Microtech devices. How many of you have heard of Microtik or Router OS before this event? Wow. How many, how many of you use them or have used them? OK. Some of you. That's good. Half of you are using. So you know what I'm talking about, and you will find this useful. That's good. Then we're going to look at reversing the support files. So these are files which your device can generate if you have a problem. And their support will ask you to send the files in. But you don't really have any idea or control of what is in those files, and is any of your private data at stake when you are sending these files to them for support. 
on NPK format, we can take a look at how packages are being installed, how systems are being upgraded, and how the format works. So those two parts are going to be technical parts of this talk. And finally, we're going to try to get try to jailbreak a real physical Microtik router, because it's easy for virtual machines, of course, and see how it goes. That's going to be a live demo. Actually, we're going to have four live demos in this one hour if everything goes OK. OK, let's get to it. Let's start with the overview of router OS. Half of you have used router OS. <coughs> this is the ecosystem for router OS. So we have the router, and we have some different things around it. In green, I have marked the mandatory components of a router. So the company makes different models. They make these uh, middle sized they make these huge, huge devices that you put into rack. Their newest device is this cool, cool little thingy. Uh, I think it's called Hub uh, Mini. Really, really small. It's still a router. So depending on the device, um, there are some optional components. Those are marked in yellow here. Here for internal storage, depending on the device, it's either flash, NAND, or a hard disk drive. What we are really interested in are, is, are our targets. The access targets for us are the file system. We want to see what is on the file system of the router. And of course, the access target is the subout rift file, the support file. Our access vectors, that is, the possibilities how we can get to our access targets, are marked in red. We have the console, our serial or USB. As you can see, serial and USB are yellow, which means this depends on the model. We have NPK files, which are the package files and that we could craft in a specific manner to maybe try and attack the router. But these are vectors, which means those are possibilities. We have direct access to removable storage. Again, it's optional. If router has removable storage, say CF card, we can directly access it. <coughs> then Microtik provides some neat tools that we can also use to as vectors. They have the web interface, they have Dude, they have Winbox, SSH, FTP, Telnet, and Netboot. Our approach uses Netboot, and that is the vector that we were able to leverage. <coughs> Let's spend 10 minutes on router OS history. When I was preparing this talk, I wanted to understand how router OS evolved, because I put the previous slide together, and I looked at all these possibilities, all these optional components, and I thought, wow, that's, that's quite a mess. That's quite many options available. So what I could find is Microtik version 2 specification sheet. That in the top right corner is date. So the July 2000. I don't know what happened to version 1. Maybe it was internal version, but version 2 was where it started at. And those of you who use Microtik might find this uh, sentimental or interesting. <coughs> These were the features of the network system at that time. These are, this is a complete list. There is nothing left out of the network features. <coughs> and you see that some of them have in brackets that this will, we will ship this in 2.1. Um, they started really, really simple, and they're growing quite fast. And that, that amazes me. By the way, Microtik are our Latvian company. I come from Latvia. Uh, they are also a Latvian company. So at least if they want to sue me, they didn't, will not have to send a lawyer to a different country. So that's good for them. <coughs> right. Network interfaces were supported. You can see that some specific network interfaces, very limited amount of network interface were supported. And if you remember these ISA cards called NE2000, huh? Yeah. <coughs> I was a citizen back then. Um, and hardware required. So Microtik version 2 was actually a software. It was not a hardware package at all. You needed uh, 486DX or better CPU. You need 16 megabytes of RAM and 32 megabytes or more of hard, risk, hard disk. 
of course, for installation, monitor and a keyboard were, were great, and floppy drive was needed. And five floppy diskettes was, was everything you needed to get it installed. <coughs> well, um, I, in preparation for this talk, I tried to use only pictures that I own myself, and I dug, dug up my archive of my pictures. Um, this is the oldest picture I could get. This is actually not 2000, this is 2004, because 2004 was the year when I got my first digital camera. Um, this one here, sorry, this one here is my router. Maybe you can't see, it says IBM PS1 on, on the corner in the blue there. It did not run Microtik, because back then Microtik software cost like $200. It ran Slackware, and I set up routing myself. But those were the boxes that might have run Microtik back then in 2000. We'll quickly go through the next couple slides. This is mainly for reference here. Year 1999, version 2 software is released. Upgrades are, upgrades are, are already available as packages. I don't know if those are NPK packages or some other format, but upgrades already happen as packages, and you can install them manually. In 2000, according to marketing materials, 2.1 comes out. I've never seen it, but it should have came out. Uh, 2001, we have two more versions. NPK format is first mentioned in 2.3. In January 2002, they changed their name from Microtic Router Software to Router OS. Nothing else changes. Well, feature set changes, but nothing major. Router OS is finally born in 2002 in January. So if anyone here is a Wikipedia fan and you update Wikipedia, you can put that in there. <coughs> right. Um, some more versions. <coughs> in 12th February 2004, Router S version 2.8 was released, and the software key system changed. Of course, uh, as I already told you, it is a software, which means you need software keys to use it. And there was a key system. In 2.8, it changed. And it actually has changed to the current algorithm. And even though official documentation says uh, you can use our current license keys with any version down to 2.9, 2.8 also works. So if any one of you wants to use 2.8, go ahead. You can downgrade. <laughs> your hardware might break, but uh, you can at least the key algorithm will match, and you will be able to import your key. August 2005, version 2.9 released. This is where new architecture is introduced. For now, we've had only x86. In 2005, six years after version 2.2, we actually have our first router board. It's RB500. It's based on MIPS architecture, little Endian version. November 2005. How I know that I reversed a bunch of firmware versions for them. Uh, so there's a file called on the file system called Nova bin login, and it's been it's been uh, Linux uh, since the very beginning, since version two. In this file, a string Nova etc slash devil dash login appears. Apparently. This file, bin login, processes your logins over Telnet. And what it does on this version 2.9.8 is it checks if the file nova etc devil login exists, and the username you're using is devil, and the password matches the password of user admin, then it launches bin sh for you, rather than the shell of Microtik, which is a known thing, right? How many of you already knew that? Just one? Two? Oh, wow. <laughs> OK. Well. It's, it's out there on the internet. Not in, this, not in such a pretty form, right? But it's out there on the internet, and this is this already known. And that allowed, I wouldn't say this was a requirement for me to be able, for my team to be able to successfully complete the research, but this gave us the motivation behind the research and actually some, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel that there is a way to do what we wanted to do. Two and a half years later, we're still at 2.9. 2.9, 51 is the last version of branch two. 
branch tree introduced in January 2008. Mid-2008, around version 3.10, Anthony, who already mentioned, releases two scripts, two Python scripts, create NPK and dump NPK on the forums of Athens Wireless Metropolitan Network. These scripts, well, one of them, allows you to unpack NPK files, which are now not only upgrade files, but also feature files, also package files that you can add as a features to your router. The other script allows you to create your own package files. Obviously, it didn't take long for people to figure out that you can create the package file that creates a file um, on the file system and get root, right? So that was sometime middle of 2008. Um, then this is just, this just interesting note. It doesn't have anything to do with, with, with jailbreaking micro routers, but I couldn't find 3.1 anywhere. Everywhere I went, it, it, it went 3.19, 3.20, 3.22, 3.23. So if anyone has 3.19, oh, sorry, 3.21, please mail it to me. I want to take a look. What are they hiding there? I mean, I have the change log. It, it's nothing, but you can't find it anywhere. But it was released. I, I can find references of it on the forums. <coughs> anyway, back to previous slides. So mid-2008, Anton released these tools. Almost a year later, Microtic added in version 3.22 verification and signing for NPK files. Installer, which is the binary that installs upgrades or features, checks the checksum of the file and the signature. So we do not get any more free lunches there. I've seen around on the internet some NPK files that are said to be signed for version 5.25, uh, I think, that are supposed to install that backdoor or, or that root access, the jailbreak. Um, I couldn't confirm. Thank you for that. <laughs> I couldn't confirm any of them working, even though people say it works. I tried them. They didn't work. What's important to note here, Starting 3.22, installer fully checks both the checksum and both the signature. So I don't know what people were talking about when they created that 5.25 version NPK. Right, then we have 4.0 in year 2009, find more zero in 11. Release cycle is now getting slower. 6.0 is released in 7th of May 2013. Since beta, since beta 3 of 6.0, uh, SquashFS is used in NPK files if, and I'm sure some of you are, interested in doing similar research for greater good. This is useful to you, I'm sure. So SquashFS is employed, um, which means it's a bit easier to unpack, uh, unpack NPK files because you don't have to deal with their own format. And the final slide for the history. Version 6.30, and today I think we're at 6.40. Version 6.30, 2015, they added SHA-1. Who loves SHA-1 here? Huh? Can we get a round of applause for SHA-1? Great function. <laughs> July 2015, they added SHA-1 digest block to NPK files, but the format which, is this, which it's in, which is ASCII, not binary, suggests it's not for ver verification or signing. It's mainly for identifying different versions of different packages. That's my wild guess. And the 633 package also includes distribution channel, which is a new feature. OK. Um, so yes, this router here, HAP Mini, this is how it looks inside. It's quite, quite small. If we, if we compare it to how they looked back in the day. Oh, by the way, that's my phone, uh, seriously. <laughs> Uh, I, I took this picture to compare the size to my to my phone, <coughs> but uh, then I also took this picture. Okay, I, I photoshopped it. I mean, gimped it, but uh, there it is. Uh, okay. Half of you use uh, or have used Routerize. I decided uh, I couldn't find it anywhere online, so I decided it would be beneficial to release a full command tree of router OS, which is uh, what I'm doing today. This is how it looks from far, from far away. Each center there is uh, one of the 
62 top-level commands. Um, I'm going to zoom in on one part of it, but first, uh, my computer has 16 gigs of RAM, so it works for me. And I, couldn't, I could even create the files and, and, and alter them. So slash IP, the PNG file that represents slash IP, uh, takes up 4 gigabytes of your RAM. When you open it with XViewer on my computer, and others take a bit less. So you can play around with it. Files themselves are not that large. They are 1 megabyte, 7 megabytes max, I think. OK, so let's take a look at that part of the image. <coughs> um, these are the smaller commands. These are just, just so you know how it looks. Um, 15 of the 62 commands, so three for those commands. Of course, for, for other commands, uh, that's much more complicated. Uh, right, the, the border means that it's uh, basically it represents what you see in the console. In the graphic console, the color is match, and the bold is represented by the border. And those are parameters, of course, here. Okay. The fun part sub out riff. Again, this is a file that you can create on your router with a command which I have forgotten <laughs> system sub out or, or something. You can look it up in the forums. And it creates a binary file. It takes, depending on the model, it, 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 uh, it can take half a minute. For this small box, it, it can take up to five minutes, also depending on how much configuration you have. And so what it creates is a file that looks like that. It has this begin router s subout section and router s subout section, and around 60-ish of them, 50, 60 these sections one by another. And then we have base64 encoded data, uh, which is not actually base64 encoded data, um, but that's a different story probably for um, Balcon in September. So each section decodes to this. Each, each section decodes to the section name, followed by byte zero, and followed by content that is compressed by zlib. So it's actually inside the sub out riff when you look in, into it. It contains your whole configuration of your router. It contains whatever is inside the folder proc at the time you launch support riff. It contains memory addresses of the processes running. Obviously, it also contains a list of processes, right? It contains your log, meaning slash log, print, whatever is there, it contains it. And it contains much more. You can see that on the picture. <coughs> Let me show you a demo here. So all demos are, are live. I have pre-recorded something, but I did test them out before coming here. Actually, one of the demos I, I tried three times in a row. It failed three times in a row. Then it started working, because I changed the Ethernet cable. Um, OK. All right, let's remove this. Let's make it larger. Great. <coughs> so there's my Python script. And there are two RIF files. Let's uh, decode one of them. That's it. It's done. It's quite quick. No encryption. Oh. Maybe they call it encryption. Basically, that's, there's some encoding. These are the sections that are inside there. So 57 sections in this sub out file. Those are the names. Notice the names of the first five sections. That will be important later on. Anyway, if we do a less again, let me move that up. We have this new folder. Uh, with these nice files. And we can take a look at some of them. Some IP sec output. <coughs> Let's take a look at the start of file.
There should be a log file. So that's a small demo. But for some time now, microtech.com also offers you a reader for these separate files. So you can check what's inside before sending it to them. Well, the only thing is it's on their home page. So you upload the file and it shows you uh, what's in the file. Let's, let's try that out. <coughs> it won't show you everything, of course. Remember those five sections that start with a dot? Well, conveniently, those sec sections are not represented at all. Not only do you don't get the content, you don't get to know that those sections are in the file. Now you do. OK, the next demo. <coughs> OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this here. And I'm going to put this over here. Perfect. <coughs> OK, so this is the home page I was talking about. It features the possibility to choose a sub out reviewer. And you can upload your sub out file over here. So let's do that. <coughs> I'm going to choose the sub out riff here, and I'm going to check out what's inside. Upload. <coughs> oh, look, a session ID. That's a different browser over there. That's a session ID that this user is logged into microdict.com. So I guess that might mean there's a cross-site scripting problem there on microdict.com. Anyway, you can view the files, of course, here, the, the sections. But that was not the point of the demo. Let's get it on. Let's remove this before someone. Oh, you know what? I'll log out before someone um, <coughs> <laughs> held it. it. It will only take a second. <coughs> you know, there are people watching this online with lots of lots of free time. <laughs> okay, we're good. We're good. Right. NPK format. So we're done with, with sub out riff. Basically, we, we know what's inside. We know how to read them. And as I hope you understand the last demo I showed, we know how to create them. NPK. This is how NPK file looks like. First of all, some general principles for NPK, which some of them are also called true for other files in Microtik. Uh, numeric values are unsigned, little endian integers, or, or whatever. <coughs> NPK files consist of header, file size, parts, and footer in that order. You can use the colors to match with a sample NPK file there. It's a real NPK file. Full size is a small one, but it's full size NPK file over there. File size is eight bytes less. Sorry, I, I'm a bit, um, I like to be precise about my presentations. Right, eight bytes less than the actual size of the file. Each part, which is a specific name here, it's not a generic part, it's, it's part that we named part um, of NPK, consists of Wow, that's unreadable. <coughs> OK. Part type, which is a short. You can see one here, 0400. It consists of payload size, which is long. You can see 68 in hex. And then <laughs> in white here, it consists of payload itself, which is what follows for those 
0x6668 bytes in that example. One thing that I learned only when making the presentation, uh, we didn't learn that during the research, <laughs> only when making the presentation, I learned that there are actually two types of current NPK files. Uh, it's, as far as I've researched, this hasn't been published anywhere. There are package files and there are restrictions, or I call them invisible packages, because I tested them out, they install, but they do not show up in your package list. Normal packages, as some of you may know, contain the header 1e, f1, d0, ba. And since version 3.22, there's a footer. Uh, that's, that's over there. Restrictions are different. They have a different header, completely different header. I don't know why that is. I mean, I have my, I have my guesses, but why would you make a header completely different for the same type of file, same company? Anyway, FB0F10A1 and a footer, 0, 3, and a bunch of, and 4, and 5 zeros. <laughs> That's NPK format. I also compiled a handy reference table for part types. And this also has never before been published online. There are some scripts online and some references that cover a small part of this table, the red part, uh, and not the whole red part. Here it is, all, all combined. The only thing we are not sure about is part type 6, because we couldn't find any NPK files that employ it. Um, and we didn't bother to reverse engineer that part of the installer. <coughs> But the idea is that the conception is since 7 is installed script for bash for the shell and 8 is uninstalled script for bash and we know that 5 is installed script for lib install, they actually have their own uh, shared object library. We, we were guessing that 6 is uninstalled script for lib install. <coughs> um, anyway, also, also in this handy table that you can use for progressing our, our work here, um, we have listed if each part is mandatory to build a valid NPK file and uh, when, which version was first this part seen in an NPK file, and when it was last seen. So that might, you might find this handy, I hope. <coughs> also, one thing I'm going to talk about um, in, uh, in Serbia is, is about uh, a bit more about this format. I had to cut a lot of slides exactly from this part of the presentation. Uh, but if you want to get on to building NPK files immediately, uh, even though you can't really sign them, um, what's important is if you have if you build a squashfest block, which is uh, 1500, you have to add zero padding, which is 1600 beforehand. A squashfest block has to start at exactly four kilobytes. Its address has to be divisible by four kilobytes from the start of the file. So you can use zero padding for that. Right. I I left two slides here um, of two interesting parts. The most interesting part is a signature, part 0900. Again, the same example there. A signature is the last part in this file. And since version 3.22, as I already told, broken packages will not be installed. By broken, that means the green part doesn't match, the file size doesn't match, something in the signature part doesn't match. Part type for signature is, as I said, 0900. And size for signature is always, and we've taken a look at tons of NPK files, it's always, if it's there, 44 bytes in hex. So that is 68 bytes total. First 20 bytes, and we have verified that, and other people have verified that before us, is SHA1, some of everything from the previous part 0, 1, up to this part. And it includes the part header, including the type and the size in SHA1 sum. It includes the part header of 0, 1 part. Do not underestimate this. And we, we are still continuing our research, and we hope we come up with a better way. Because signature applies, read it carefully, only to data from the previous 0, 01 part. And you can have multiple 0, 01 parts, and they will have multiple signatures. The question is, and we haven't been successful, even though we only tried for a day, um, so that's not real research yet, 
we haven't been successful in making installer accept something in between, but basically the format doesn't forbid you to, to insert some stuff, some parts in between 09 and then following 01. So we're going to be looking at that. Remaining 48 bytes are unknown signature. There are some speculations online about what kind of signature that is, but I can leave that uh, to you to Google because we ha have not confirmed any of the algorithms. We tried multiple al algorithms. Nothing worked. Uh, we did find uh, probably a public key, though. Here it is. You can make it into a flag so that uh, it doesn't disappear <laughs> with the presentation, like freedom flag or something. Uh, maybe it's a seed for some algorithm. It, it is a seed for, we found an algorithm, again, this research, this part hasn't been completed. So we think the public key is that, because when we change that into binary, the second part verification fails. Also very interesting, last byte of the signature is always less than 0x10. In this example, it's 0d. We've never seen a signature with last byte being more than that. So. We hope this will also allow us to better understand what it is and use this interesting feature to try to identify at least the type of the algorithm used here, if not fully repeat the verification step. Of course, it is very likely it is a public key. It is very likely it is asymmetrical cryptography, which means that we would not be able to create NPK files with valid signature. But then again, there are ways, which is not part of this presentation. <coughs> OK, part 17, digest. I already mentioned it. It's actually on the top of the file. It's 40 bytes long, and it asks a representation of SHA1 SHA hash of something. Uh, we weren't able to yet understand what exactly, but it being in ASCII uh, means it's we're quite sure it's not really any crypto or security feature. It's more likely an identifier, because ASCII is used for human-readable information rather than something that you uh, want to process by a small binary on a small device like that. If, it, if we change that, um, the file doesn't install, because it is, um, it is hashed by this uh, signature block. That's the reason. But other than that, it's, it's uh, easily changeable. OK. Uh, fun part number two. So how do you route a router? For those of you who are not good with networks, uh, probably the other half who hasn't used Microtic, right? Uh, router is a device. Routing is getting root or admin privileges on the device. Uh, we can call it jailbreaking routers if, if, it's, uh, float, if it floats your boat. Right. So how to get shell? Well, technically, it's easy. You create the file, and you tell it, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, uh, how do you create a file on here? Uh, when we had uh, hard disk drives 17 years ago, well, we still have them, but for, for this software, when we were using hard disk drives, it was easy. Um, we saw the access vectors at the beginning of the presentation. We can use some of those. But let's imagine we somehow create a file. Then we tell it, and we are greeted with root prompt. Then we type ls to check out what's happening there. And the ls isn't there. So we can't really see anything, which is a pity. Luckily, that's not really a problem. Because, uh, well, they didn't disable tab completion. <laughs> <laughs> this is even better than doing echo asterisk, because it's, it's, it formats it for you correctly. <coughs> or you can, of course, do it properly and upload the busy box. Uh, if you do that, make sure it's statically linked, and it's for the right architecture. U name minus M, after you get your root, will tell you what architecture are you on. Um, this link might be of interest for, for those of you doing that. But you can find it online, of course. Now the question becomes, can we speed this process up? Yes, yes, we can speed it up. A VirtualBox appliance that does most of the work for you. And this should work out nicely. But again, oh, we will add 
more support for more systems uh, until September. Currently, it works if your CPU is uh, exactly AR9344, which are these devices. We have actually tested it on, the, on these two devices. We are sure it might work on that, um, them. <laughs> uh, the tool actually says that you will break your device for, for legal reasons, right? Uh, so you will break your device. Um, right. OK. So how to use the appliance? This is slide here is for reference. And we can do the demo. So what you do is you import the appliance into VirtualBox by double clicking on it if you have graphical interface. Um, you should make sure that your bridge network card is set to Ethernet. You should disconnect all wires from the router and power it up. That's what I just did. So I took my router, I just powered it up. It has no wires connected. It just booted. You should start the virtual machine and follow to instructions. And you should be ready to swiftly replug the cable when prompted. OK. <laughs> Let's do it. Right. So this is uh, already imported, it, of course. We can go to settings here and verify that network is indeed set to bridged. Ethernet 0 is the adapter I'm going to be using here on my laptop. Uh, I have a wire plugged into that. Let's start it up. Presentation is not affiliated with Oracle or VirtualBox. <coughs> Actually, guys, you know what? Uh, when I was demo testing these today, I remembered that I should shut down the wireless interface because they, they come from factory without a password, with open Wi-Fi. I think I did now. <coughs> OK, so here it is. It's our interface. Um, it says stuff that it says. I hope you can read. So what we need to do, we need to uh, plug in the cable from that set network card, which is on zero on my laptop here, into port 2 on the device. And now we need some info. We need the IP address of the router. Oh, my bad, sorry. Um, I should show you that it's not jailbroken yet, otherwise the demo is useless, right? OK. Let me connect it. So I'm going to use this protocol called Telnet. If you remember that, I'm going to use admin. There we are. We're inside. And I'm going to try the same with devil. And nothing happens. OK, so back to jailbreaking. Right, enter the IP address. The default IP address is handily there. Username. And the password, in this case, password is not set. And answer that it's <coughs> correctly set. So now it tries to get an IP address. Oh, I have 10 seconds. Hold on. OK. Uh, so I had to quickly replug this Ethernet cable into port 1. So it's actually it's, it's not super super nice tool, but it's quite easy. All you have to do is press buttons on your computer and plug the cable. <coughs> so now it will wait for the device to boot into our jailbreak. This is the only demo that can actually um, go wrong, because it has gone wrong when testing. OK, cool, cool. For two. Now it has booted into our jailbreak image. And now it will launch the jailbreak, activate the jailbreak. <coughs> Connecting may be shown up to 20 times, but it will work in the end. Usually it shows just one time. Sometimes it shows a lot of times. So no need to worry here. Unless you know you're in a hurry, like doing a presentation or something. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's connected. Uh, I mean, the, the wire is connected, but it's trying to connect SSH. OK, there we are. It connected to SSH. And you couldn't unplug your device at any point. Now you don't, don't want to unplug your device anymore. 
Now it's executing the jailbreak, writing the files. OK, there we have. Jailbreak was successful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what it does, it actually looks for all partitions on the device and tries to see if, if, if it's a router OS partition. It found one um, partition number two, and it did everything that had to be done, including installing BusyBox. Um, router already rebooted automatically for us. Let's press Enter to shut, out, shut it down. Let's close VirtualBox. We don't need any more. And now I'm going to use my laptop to get an IP address. <coughs> Whoops. Let's try to Telnet now. OK. It should still work as admin. Yep. <coughs> and if you type in devil, there we are. It's root. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> so that's it's, it's really this device. Um, how can I prove it to you? Well, uh, I don't know. Let me type. OK, this is yes. Oh, well, but you're not going to see it. Oh, let's. This should work. <laughs> if I unplug this cable here, it stops. So it's really this device. All righty then. Let's get back to a couple of slides we have remaining. We don't need this anymore. <coughs> so that was that was a nice demo. Well, the only question that I have promised you I will answer today, and I haven't done, I haven't answered yet, is can the router bot actually play for all that? Well, let's look at the demo. I'm going to get an IP address. This, this router is already jailbroken. <laughs> and it's not only jailbroken, I think it should have this file over here. If we can get the audio, yes, we have it. There we have it. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> OK, so tools are not yet available on my GitHub. They will be. I hope I'm, I'm going to get to that tomorrow. Um, so you can ask me a question soonish, or you can also uh, get to me in one of those ways. Thank you very much. Thank you for that quite great demonstration, I think. Very courageous to do all that live, I would say. And it worked, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so now we still have 10 minutes left for questions. We have two microphones. Please, li please line up. Yes. Yeah. Um, can we check the front mic? Is it on? Hello. Then let's uh, let's start with the second back mic for now. Um, can you ask a question? Is it working? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, First of all, that's rather cool. Well done. Um, secondly, does this provide any attacks that can be done without physical access to the machine? 
as long as I keep the server room locked and my safe? Well, um, <laughs> so there is this organization called uh, CIA, right? <clears throat> and there was this leak that was dubbed the Vault 7 by some. And there was this exploit for binary called uh, web, or dub, 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 I guess. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't yet have the time to compare the two versions, the patched one and unpatched one, but we will do that. So that, there's your answer. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, for the t thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. What's happening inside of the black box of your <laughs> OVA image? Um, nothing that I haven't told you. So we do use OpenWRT. Uh, we do create the file. We do install BusyBox. No magic. It's just uh, easier to use. All and right. the image, of course, will also be available. Today I learned GitHub doesn't accept uh, 200, 250 megabyte files. So <laughs> there will be a link on GitHub to the, to the file. All right, and a second question. I don't want to be too difficult about it, but have you reached out to uh, Microtech about the uh, XSS and other stuff that you found? Well, other stuff isn't really stuff. Um, XSS is the reason why we are not releasing the um, tool for generating sub object files today. Hey, pleased to meet you two again. One question, the uh, hidden file, when I install it on x86, I see this uh, Kalia option. Is that a hidden package? Kalia is a real package. It's not a hidden package. If you install it, it actually shows up in your package list. Uh, Kalia package is used for lawful intercepts in the United States. And you can download it uh, rather freely, and you can play around with it. Any more questions? If not, I guess we can find you on the campgrounds yep. or tweet you. You are, over there. you are also an angel, so people oh. might run into you in that capacity. Yes, yes. I, I became the speaker desk uh, supervisor by accident, and now I'm sitting over there. This is my third talk. The first one was by Billy. Then I had a workshop yesterday, and this is the third talk, the third talk I'm attending this Congress. <laughs> So thank you for a great talk. Thank you for being a great volunteer and just general. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>